With the Conservatives rallying around Pompeius Magnus, nominating him consul without a colleague for the first half of the 52 BC year, followed by his sharing the remainder of the consulship with his father-in-law and Bonnie member, Metellus Scipio, the Conservatives easily dominated the elections for the 51 BC year. Although Marcus Porcius Cato ran for election to the 51 BC consulship, he was beaten by Servius Sulpicius Rufus and Marcus Claudius Marcellus. Servius Sulpicius Rufus had at one time been a friend of Cicero's, studying rhetoric with him on the island of Rhodes, while Cicero was away from Rome, avoiding Sulla's retribution for having exposed the corruption within his dictatorial regime. Sulpicius first ran for the consulship in 63 BC, but owing to the wealth of Sempronia Tuditani, the support of Cicero, and the influence of Publius Clodius on the legions, he'd lost that election to Lucius Licinius Murina. Sulpicius Rufus had charged Murina with bribery, but had lost his case when Cicero chose to represent Murina. Marcus Claudius Marcellus was another conservative who sided with Pompeius and the Senate, against Caesar. As consul, Marcellus began legislation to name Caesar's replacement in Gaul, with no opposition from Sulpicius. Caesar's proconsulship of Gaul had been extended by the Lex Trebonia, as part of his agreement with Pompeius and Crassus at the Lucca Conference, which had taken place in 56 BC. Unfortunately, the Lex Trebonia did not specify when Caesar's second five-year term began and ended, a fact which Marcellus and Senate conservatives exploited. The arrangement had been designed to give Caesar protection under his proconsular imperium until he could legally run for the consulship, ten years after his 59 BC term. Marcellus and the conservatives argued that Caesar's second five-year term began when the Lex Trebonia passed, in March of 55 BC. According to this timeline, Caesar's proconsular imperium was scheduled to terminate by March 1 of the 50 BC year. Caesar's constituents contended that the law passed by the ten tribunes of the plebs, in 52 BC, which allowed Caesar to stand for consular election in absentia, for his proper year, was proof that the Senate understood his second five-year term was meant to begin at the end of his first term, in 53 BC. Senate conservatives, however, ignored this detail. They set a deadline of March 1 for Caesar to lay down his arms, and return to Rome as a private citizen. Pompeius Magnus, who had negotiated the arrangement with Caesar in 56 BC, remained obtuse during the debates. Appian tells us that Pompeius agreed that Caesar should keep his proconsular command until its intended expiration date, but that this was merely a pretense of friendship with Caesar. Pompeius did not wish to lose the support of the people who, greatly admiring Caesar's almost superhuman conquest of Gaul, as well as his being the first Roman general to lead an army across the Rhine River into Germania, and then into Britannia, were continually singing Caesar's praises. Yet, despite his hollow recommendation that Caesar be allowed to hold his command until its expiration date, Pompeius, who was always pulling strings behind the scenes to bring about his intended results, suddenly stopped, instead choosing to pretend to be just an ex-consul whose hands were tied. In response to Pompeius's silence, Caesar flooded his senatorial constituency with gold, in order to win their votes. He also purchased the support of many candidates running for political offices that afforded the potential to block such legislation. We don't know exactly how much gold Caesar channeled from Gaul into Rome in his attempt to stop the Boni from revoking his command, but we are told he paid 10 million sesterces for the support of one particular man who was running for the office of Tribune of the Plebs for the 50 BC year. The marriage of Gaius Scribonius Curio to Fulvia Flacca Bambula, the widow of Publius Clodius, made Curio very suddenly one of Rome's most important freshman politicians. Curio was already popular with the people for having been, as a youth, an outspoken critic of Caesar's 59 BC consulship. And now Curio was sitting at the head of Rome's urban plebs and Rome's many collegia, as benefits of his new wife's dowry. Additionally, Curio was a close associate of Marcus Antonius, the two rumoured to have been lovers during their teenage years. 
Marcus Antonius had performed so well as cavalry commander against both Vercus of Alornos and Vercingetorix, that following the Battle of Elysia, Caesar again sent Antonius to Rome to run for election as quaestor. Antonius had attempted to gain the quaestorship in 53 BC, but due to Publius Clodius's delaying of elections, had failed to secure the office before rejoining Caesar in Gaul. Following his quaestorship of 52 BC, Caesar promoted Marcus Antonius to the position of legate, and gave him two full legions to command. As a legate, equal in rank with Titus Labienus and Caesar's other commanders, Marcus Antonius thus gained a voice within Caesar's war councils. It is likely that Antonius, on the rise in Caesar's estimation, played a pivotal role in apprising Caesar of the sudden impact of Gaius Scribonius Curio's new position, as well as in advising how best to guarantee Curio's support once Curio became tribune of the plebs for the 50 BC year. With the deadline for Caesar to lay down his arms set for March 1, elections for the 50 BC year were held. Curio, whom the conservatives thought of as one of them, easily won election to the plebeian tribunate, and both consular offices were also won by conservatives. Gaius Claudius Marcellus, who was married to Caesar's grandniece, Octavia, won election as consul alongside another opponent of Caesar's named Lucius Aemilius Paulus Lepidus. Gaius Claudius Marcellus was a cousin of the 51 BC consul, Marcus Claudius Marcellus, and equally determined to stop Caesar. Lucius Aemilius Paulus was a grandson of the tribune, Lucius Apelius Saturninus, who had been stoned to death on the Senate house floor a half-century earlier, and he was a son of the Marcus Aemilius Lepidus who, 28 years earlier, had launched a rebellion against Rome, which he lost, thanks to Pompeius Magnus. Soon after taking office in 50 BC, Gaius Claudius Marcellus, who saw no evidence that Caesar intended to abide by his March 1 deadline to disarm, began legislation designed to force Caesar to step down from his command. Unexpectedly, his co-consul, Paulus, whose pockets had been recently made heavy by Caesar, and who needed little persuasion to side against Pompeius Magnus, opposed the legislation, leading to pandemonium within the Senate. Gaius Scribonius Curio, now in the pay of Caesar, but not wishing it to be known, began calling for the mutual disarmament of both Caesar and Pompeius. This boosted his popularity with the people even higher, as they saw him as the only true politician within the Senate, willing to invite the enmity of both generals in his pursuit of a peaceful resolution. Hoping to make Caesar look like the aggressor, Pompeius Magnus declared that he would happily lay down his command, just as soon as Caesar did. Because Pompeius could see no way for Caesar to lay down his command without facing immediate prosecution by Cato and the Boni, he counted on Caesar's refusal causing Caesar to injure his own reputation with the populace. But, Gaius Scribonius Curio was ready for such a move. Turning the tables on Pompeius, as he sat comfortably in Rome, not even bothering to show up to govern his own extended command in Hispania, Curio painted the general into a corner. Pompeius became the actual threat to Rome's government. At the moment, Caesar's legions were the counterbalance to the almost unlimited power Pompeius Magnus wielded in Rome. Curio argued that for Caesar to lay down his arms first, was for Caesar to make himself vulnerable to attack. Pompeius must show Caesar that he was no threat, either by giving up his command first, or by agreeing to lay down their commands simultaneously, on a specified date. The Boni argued that agreeing to a mutual disarmament on a specified date was impossible, as Pompeius would be forced to disarm without knowing for certain that Caesar had done so. On and on the arguments went. Every attempt made by the Caesarians to disarm Pompeius was vetoed by Marcellus or a conservative tribune of the plebs, and every attempt made by the Pompeians to disarm Caesar was vetoed by Paulus or Curio. In the meantime, the March 1 deadline had come and gone, with Caesar still commanding his legions in Gaul, under the protection of his proconsular imperium. Realizing that, until Caesar's tribunes were out of office at the end of November, nothing would be accomplished, the Senate issued another deadline for Caesar to lay down his command, 
for November of the 50 BC year. Despite the Senate splitting into Caesarian and Pompeian factions, there was a portion of the Senate who, realizing civil war was on the horizon, genuinely supported the disarmament of both generals. When word came from Gaius Cassius Longinus, who had taken over as proquestor of Syria following the death of Marcus Licinius Crassus, the Senate found an opportunity to relieve both generals of, at least some of their legions. Cassius, expecting an imminent attack from Parthia, desperately requested troops be sent to support the Roman province of Syria. The Senate voted, and unanimously decided that both men, Caesar and Pompeius, must donate a full legion to Syria. And with the unanimous support of the Senate, neither general was in a position to refuse. Caesar agreed to send his legion. Pompeius Magnus, too, chose to send a legion. However, Pompeius announced that his donated legion would be the legion he had loaned Caesar three years earlier. Outplayed by Pompeius Magnus, and suddenly deprived of two of his ten legions, Caesar's position of strength began to crumble. It was time for Caesar to act.